not worry. We will have plenty of free foods on the windows, on the entire terrace, so there is space for everybody. And we have special tapes for that. We will have to do it, however, at the start of the session. We have your poster view and put it by any slot on the boards. Don't panic. Okay? For instead, the people that have them already on the boards, but with, uh, outside of these rules, please comply with them because this allows. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in the lecture this morning and the lecture yesterday, uh, I tried to explain an overall idea to you, which is that in these systems with uh, macroscopic numbers of degrees of freedom, but constraints between them, uh, we can have emergent degrees of freedom at long distances which are quite different from the microscopic degrees of freedom that we started with. So in the models that I've talked about, we had microscopic degrees of freedom, which were the spins or the dimers, and we ended up with these long distance degrees of freedom, which we could think of as uh, fluxes, uh, which satisfy um, a divergent zero constraint. Uh, so that's like electromagnetism, and in the jargon you talk about that as being a U1 gauge theory, and then when I uh, discuss differences uh, with Daimler models defined on non-bipartite lattices, we had the alternative possibility of a Z2 gauge theory. Um, so what I want to talk about this afternoon is uh, a set of real physical systems, magnetic materials, which are the best realizations of the general physics that I've been describing. And these materials have become known as spin ice for reasons that I'm going to talk about as I, as I go through. So uh, the overall context is given by this slide that I used at the beginning, so I was talking about frustrated units of spins with antiferromagnetic interactions between all the spins in the cluster, and uh, we could think of clusters of various sizes, but now I want to specialize uh, focusing on tetrahedra, so the number of spins in the cluster Q is equal to four, and I want to think specifically about Ising spins, so the number of components becomes one. And if we're just considering a single cluster, as in these pictures, if we're thinking about Ising spins, then uh, according to uh, this way of uh, thinking about ground state energies, uh, minimizing the total magnetization of the cluster, the ground states are clearly ones in which two spins are up and two spins are down. And so if we count the number of ground states for a single tetrahedron, it's uh, four choose two, uh, in other words, uh, there are six ground states. Um, and the question that we're going to be thinking about is how that generalizes when we connect these clusters together, in fact, in an edge form, edge sharing, uh, sorry, in a corner sharing fashion, and uh, also, of course, how the uh, ground state constraint uh, in each cluster uh, generates long-range correlations of the types that I've been talking about in terms of uh, a Coulomb phase. So not all of the details of the lattice will be important, but this is a picture of the so-called pyrochlor lattice built out of corner-sharing tetrahedra. And uh, perhaps the one simplifying fact to keep in mind is that it's uh, a cubic lattice. Uh, in the end, but obviously a, a cubic lattice with uh, several sites in the basis. So the actual materials are ones that have magnetic ions on uh, these sites that form uh, corner sharing tetrahedra, and the magnetic ions are rare earth ions, uh, which have rather the large angular momentum when they're uh, isolated. Um, 
but in these materials, they're not isolated. They feel a crystal field, and that splits the angular momentum levels, and the lowest uh, levels are ones that correspond to the magnetic moments being orientated either out of or into uh, the tetrahedron along the uh, high symmetry direction. Um, and uh, the effect of the interactions between the spins, which are actually a combination of exchange interactions and dipolar interactions, is to give you lowest energy configurations which have uh, two spins oriented into the tetrahedron and two spins oriented out. So if we represent in and out by uh, up and down for Ising spins, then uh, we have a Hamiltonian, which is equivalent to the uh, nearest neighbor Ising antiferromagnet on this lattice. Uh, so are there any, any questions about that basic starting point? Okay, so now we want to connect these tetrahedra up to um, form a, a big lattice. And um, there's a kind of amusing aside, but it also has quite a useful point to it, which I'll get onto in a moment. But the aside is to do with why this material got called spin ice. And the point is that there's a, a rather good analogy a precise analogy with problems which people had thought about in uh, physical chemistry, uh, and in particular, Linus Pauling thought about. So uh, these are problems involving uh, ice uh, in its solid phase. And um, of course, you have uh, oxygen two minus ions and protons, and the whole uh, ice crystal is held together by hydrogen bonds. Um, and if you think in detail about the structure, then uh, one oxygen ion has uh, four neighbors, um, and the protons on these bonds, which are, sorry, I should have said the open circles represent the oxygens and the black points represent the uh, protons. And uh, if you think of water as H2O, then two of the protons uh, on the bonds associated with a particular oxygen uh, should be close to that oxygen, and two of them should be close to neighboring oxygens. And uh, this too close, too far rule is just the same as the uh, two in, two out for uh, a tetrahedron in the magnetic material. So uh, there's uh, a complete analogy uh, between uh, spin configurations in the ground states of this magnetic system and uh, proton arrangements in uh, water ice. So uh, one of the points that uh, Pauling made, which we can take over, involves uh, an estimate of the number of uh, ground state configurations uh, that there are uh, in uh, a problem like this. And um, I guess the first point to make is that there is, uh, as with the other problems that I've been talking about, uh, a macroscopic uh, degeneracy in these ground states. And the um, simplest way of seeing that is by seeing that you can construct things which are analogs of the loops of flippable dimers uh, that I talked about when I was talking about dimer models. Uh, so you can think of going through the lattice, uh, forming loops which alternately visit spins that are pointing into, into a tetrahedron um, and uh, pointing out. So for instance, we could uh, draw a loop that goes through this site and then goes through that site. And we can always continue in the next tetrahedron and the one after and the one after because we can always find an exit point with a spin in the direction that we want. And uh, presumably some of those loops will end up being closed in uh, typical uh, spin configurations. And then once we've formed a loop like that, we can reverse all of the spins 
on the loop because uh, if in each tetrahedron the loop includes one spin that's going in and one that's going out, if we reverse both of those spins, we uh, preserve uh, this ground state rule. And if we reverse spins on uh, independent loops, then we're uh, generating a macroscopic amount of, of entropy. So uh, what Pauling suggested was a way of estimating this entropy and it's very much in the spirit of mean field theory, so you might think that it wouldn't be a terribly good estimate, but as I'll show you in a moment, it, it turns out to be extremely good, uh, and uh, it's quite nice to see how things play out. So the way the estimate goes is in two steps. So first of all, we think about a, a single tetrahedron, and uh, we've got four spins, each independently with two states, so altogether we've got 16 states for the tetrahedron. Of course, some of these states will be excited states. Uh, the ones that are ground states are just six out of the 16, so this is the, the fraction that are ground states. So now we take that information uh, from thinking about a single tetrahedron and uh, go to the whole lattice, and we say that uh, the best simple estimate that we can make of the number of ground states in the whole lattice is to take the total number of spin configurations and then reduce it by this factor for each tetrahedron in the system. And uh, so to complete the calculation, we just need to put the dependence on system size in, in full. So the number of states is uh, two to the power of the number of spins. Um, and the number of tetrahedra, well, there are four spins in each tetrahedron, but each spin is uh, shared between uh, two tetrahedra. So the number of tetrahedra is half the number of spins. So this power of the number of tetrahedra, we can replace with half the number of spins. And then if we combine these two factors uh, in uh, a single fraction and cancel things down, we have uh, an estimate for the total number of states, which is uh, three halves to the power, half the number of spins, um, uh, as, as being our estimate of the ground state entropy. Uh, are there any questions on how that logic goes? Okay. Um, so then the beautiful thing is that actually you can do experiments which see almost precisely that. And so the experiments involve measuring the entropy as a function of temperature of one of these materials. Now, of course, experimentally, you don't measure entropy directly. In fact, all you can do is measure entropy differences between states at two different temperatures. And the way that you do that is by measuring the heat capacity as a function of temperature and then saying the entropy changes the uh, heat divided by the temperature and integrating it. Um, of course, even talking about the heat capacity, we have to be careful because our interest here is clearly the magnetic degrees of freedom. But if we measure the heat capacity, then there'll be contributions, at least in principle, from uh, the lattice vibrations and so on. So uh, sometimes you can subtract the contribution from the lattice vibrations by uh, making a, a similar compound but without magnetic degrees of freedom and subtracting the two heat capacities and so on. So uh, you do that kind of thing and have a heat capacity as a function of temperature uh, that's uh, just from the magnetic degrees of freedom, and then by integrating it, you can get uh, entropy differences between two different states of the material. Uh, but what we want to talk about is absolute entropies, so we need some reference state with known entropy. And here, things are nice and simple, because if we go to high temperatures, then uh, the system will be completely thermally disordered, and so the entropy should be Kb log 2 per spin, or uh, R log 2 um, per, per mole. 
Um, so what's done in this experiment is to take that value as the uh, high temperature value and you see from this temperature scale that all of the interactions in this material are, are rather weak. They're on the scale of a few Kelvin, so we only have to go to 10 Kelvin to see the uh, full uh, entropy of the high temperature state. And you measure how much entropy comes out as you cool down. And now because you've used the high temperature state to get an absolute value of entropy, you know that uh, if you cool to uh, a unique ground state or a ground state with uh, uh, a finite degeneracy, you'd have uh, zero entropy, and so you expect to end up down here. And what you actually measure from the heat capacity is some residual low temperature entropy, uh, and the picture is that that's because of uh, precisely uh, the degeneracies that I've been talking about. So any... Any questions there? Okay, uh, so that's kind of reassuring. Uh, it means at least at the zeroth order, the physics that I was talking about yesterday and this morning is present uh, in this material. Uh, but of course, that was really just our starting point. And so what we'd like to do is go further and uh, see whether some of the more sophisticated things uh, to do with this uh, Coulomb phase uh, are also there as well. Yes? Uh, well, it's very much in the spirit of uh, a mean field calculation. I mean, it's outrageous, really, to say that we can simply take the fraction of ground states that we compute when we think about an isolated tetrahedron and uh, use that fraction when we're calculating the uh, ground state of a whole lattice. So uh, the surprise is not that there's a discrepancy, uh, but that the match is actually as good as it is. Uh, I, uh, but I mean, of course, there could be other reasons uh, why there's a discrepancy, and I, I don't actually know whether it's uh, because of uh, failures in the um, mean field calculation or because of uh, differences between the uh, real material and the model. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the question was, can you also get this entropy difference from the coarse grain model? And that's uh, a very useful question. And the answer is no, and the point is that um, when we coarse grain, we're somehow uh, integrating out short distance degrees of freedom, we're averaging over short loops of spins that can be flipped, and uh, the entropy adds up contributions from all scales, and unless we have that short distance physics under control, then uh, we can't calculate this number, uh, which um, is not exactly a non-universal number, but it's very specific to the details of the lattice and so on. Okay, uh, so to get at um, the Coulomb physics, we really want to be thinking about long distance properties. And um, so, Locally, we know that the constraint written in terms of these Ising variables is that in each tetrahedron, we have two spins up, two spins down, so the total Ising magnetization of the tetrahedra is zero. And you can actually see in a rather elementary way that that must lead to some long-range correlations because imagine that you worked out the total magnetization of the spins in the lowest plane of this picture, which I'm trying to indicate with the pointer, and you compared it with the magnetization of the spins in the plane above. Now, because together they make up the tetrahedra in the lowest layer, you know that whatever the magnetization is in uh, the lowest plane, uh, you must have opposite that magnetization in the plane above, and if we go up through the stack, then we have some alternating pattern of magnetization. So there's some kind of long-range correlation there. And 
this is a, a calculation of uh, correlations uh, as you would uh, see in um, the Fourier transform. And um, what the Fourier transform shows, obviously, is some sharp features. And sharp features in reciprocal space must be uh, related in real space to some long-range correlations. So uh, this idea in real space matches qualitatively with this picture in reciprocal space. And what we'd like to do is uh, see how things work out in a more uh, detailed fashion. Um, So there's uh, a mapping which I'm going to talk about at uh, various levels uh, to precisely the uh, three-dimensional Coulomb phase uh, description uh, that I had this morning. And um, the simplest way of presenting things is in terms of the pictures that I've drawn here. So uh, the rule for constructing ground states is that in each tetrahedron, we have two spins pointing in and two pointing out. And I obviously haven't drawn all of the spins in this picture, but at least uh, I've drawn arrangements for the spins that I have represented, which are consistent with this rule. Um, so now at the simplest level, in your mind, you can imagine connecting these spins together in a way that gives you flux lines and in a way that ensures that the flux lines uh, never end. They just uh, are either infinitely long or close into uh, closed loops. In other words, these flux lines are divergenceless. And the point is that if every tetrahedron contains uh, two spins that are pointing in and two that are pointing out, then we can take uh, one of the ingoing spins and pair it up with an outgoing spin and say that that's a segment of a flux line and we'll always be able to continue this flux line uh, into the next tetrahedron and so on until uh, either we reach the edge of the sample or it closes on itself. So there's a, a direct mapping uh, from uh, the spin configurations to flux lines and that's exactly the sort of thing that we had uh, when we were talking about Coulomb phases. Um, of course, you can do that in a, a more precise way, and uh, that's what I'm explaining in detail on this slide. And there are some specific points to take in, uh, but I think it's worth concentrating on how the details actually work. So the, the first point that you have to absorb to uh, see how the details work is that we need to have in mind two lattices. So on the one hand, I've, I've drawn in blue the pyrochlor lattice made out of corner-sharing tetrahedra. Um, and at the same time, we can introduce a second lattice, which is sometimes called a parent lattice. And the sites of the parent lattice uh, are at the centers of each of the tetrahedra. And the bonds of the parent lattice are these arrows that are drawn in red here. So there was uh, something similar which happened when I talked about the triangular lattice sizing model and the dimer representation. Uh, and maybe it would help the visualization if I explain it in that case. So uh, in the case of the triangular lattice Ising model, if I draw a bit of the lattice, we might have something like that. And then I said that for the mapping to uh, the dimer model, the dimers were located on the bonds of a honeycomb lattice. So. The analogy is that these sites of the honeycomb lattice that I've drawn uh, in yellow are at the centers of the triangles. And in the same way, the sites of the lattice, the parent lattice with the red bonds, are at the centers of the uh, tetrahedra. Now, actually, if you think about the geometry of things, you realize that this parent lattice with the red bonds 
is in fact uh, a diamond lattice. And the diamond lattice is bipartite, just as the uh, hexagonal lattice here uh, is bipartite. So uh, the great feature of bipartite lattices is that they give us an easy way of uh, introducing an orientation convention on the links. We can take uh, sublattices A and B and direct the links from sublattice A to sublattice B. And uh, that's what the red arrows are showing in this picture. Uh, the uh, site of the parent lattice at the center of the picture is on sublattice A, and the orientation convention is uh, that the arrows are going to the other sublattice. Okay, so that's uh, setting up some machinery, and um, these uh, oriented links we represent with unit vectors uh, with a corresponding orientation in, in real space. Now, the mapping from spin configurations to fluxes says that on one of these links, we have uh, unit flux in the direction of the link if the corresponding Ising spin is plus one and uh, minus unit flux if the corresponding uh, Ising spin is minus one. And then the uh, ground state constraint, which says that two spins are up and two spins are down in each tetrahedron, means that we have two units of flux coming into the tetrahedron and two units going out. And so uh, this uh, divergence-free condition uh, is uh, exactly the same as the um, ground state condition uh, in the Ising language. So in other words, uh, the way this is working is exactly analogous to the mapping to a height model that I had for the uh, triangular lattice antiferromagnet, but now, of course, we're thinking about a three-dimensional problem. Um, so are there any, any questions about how any of that worked? Uh, yeah, well, I think that's the, that's the sublattice. That, that's the point about the, uh, the parent lattice, the diamond lattice, having uh, two sublattices. Yeah. Okay, so now we uh, do the uh, hand-waving bit, and we say that uh, we're interested in long-distance physics, and so we're going to coarse grain a bit, and um, that will be averaging over these short length loops of spins, averaging over their orientations, and by the same sorts of arguments that I used before, uh, we expect that uh, the uh, configurations with uh, the most entropy will be ones with uh, lowest uh, local values for this uh, flux density, and so we get uh, a probability distribution which I could write either in terms of the vector potential or in terms of the B, uh, the, the flux density, in the way that I have been doing before. Um, and so the picture that we get from that is, well, if we uh, coarse grain, we have uh, some ensemble of flux loops, and then by the calculation which I started with uh, in the lecture in the morning, we end up with this correlator between uh, components of this emergent field. Uh, but now, uh, this emergent field also corresponds to the uh, spin correlations themselves because uh, there's a direct connection between the local value of the flux and the local orientation of the spins. And so we can expect that we can uh, see uh, these correlations in the spin correlations themselves. Now, if we're going to think about the details of how that translation from the uh, fluxes uh, to the spins, uh, if we're going to think in detail about how that works, uh, we, we need to um, go into uh, things reasonably carefully. Um, and I suppose the basic point is that um, as far as the emergent flux is concerned, uh, the 
uh, long wavelength correlations are revealed uh, at small wave vectors. Um, but when we think about the translation to spins, it, it turns out that we're not looking at uh, zero wave vector for reasons that I'm going to try and uh, explain. Um, okay, so I said that the pyrochlor lattice is a cubic lattice, but it has uh, several sites in the basis. Uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, the four sites in the tetrahedron uh, as uh, the sites uh, in, in the basis. Um, and um, so we can think of transforming between uh, the spin orientations on those four sites, or if we go into reciprocal space, the Fourier components of the spin orientations on those four sites, and uh, the emergent uh, gauge field uh, that appears in this long wavelength description. And uh, there are four spins and three components to the emergent gauge field. We expect there should be some other degree of freedom, and the other degree of freedom turns out to be the uh, local average to the magnetization or uh, its uh, Fourier component. Um, and uh, of course, in principle, there should be some transformation between these different degrees of freedom, and it turns out that it's given by this uh, four by four matrix. And I want to try and give you a, a feel for uh, how you read off some of the entries in that matrix, and hopefully, if I can give you a feel for some of it, then uh, the rest will seem plausible. So it seems to me this is something that uh, is best explained in in real time, so uh, let me first of all draw a picture of uh, a tetrahedron. Um, so this is meant to be a three-dimensional drawing and this is the edge which is behind. And I'll number things in a way that's consistent with the picture, so these are sites two and three and uh, one and four. And um, let me suppose that I have uh, a particular ground state spin configuration in this tetrahedron uh, with, say, the spin at site 2 and at site 1 pointing into the tetrahedron and the spins at sites 4 and 3 pointing out of the tetrahedron. And then I want to relate this to some axes in the space where the crystal lives. Uh, and so these can be the cubic axes. And I'll take x, y, and z like that. And now I want to think what this spin configuration corresponds to in terms of components of this emergent field. So um, on average, what this represents is a field that's in this direction. So in other words, we have an x component to the field. And um, it's true that up here, there's uh, a component in the z direction. But on average, it's canceled by the minus z component here, and similar things on the other sites. Um, so what I'm saying, if I invert that relation, is the bx, it's well, if I have um, plus one and minus one to represent spins which are either into or out of the tetrahedron, then the fact that spins one and two are pointing into the tetrahedron means that they contribute positively to Bx. And the fact that three and four are out of the tetrahedron, that also means that they contribute positively to Bx. But if they're pointing out of the tetrahedron, uh, and I used S equals plus one to uh, record the fact that these two spins are pointing in, then uh, those would have a minus sign. So um, absorbing that, I'd say that the x component of flux is related to the spin configurations in, in that way. 
And in a similar but rather trivial way, we'd say that the total magnetization in terms of these Ising degrees of freedom for the tetrahedron is just the sum of the uh, four spins. So now we can go back to what I've got written here. And so the claim is that there's a transformation between uh, the spin orientations at these four sites and some uh, degrees of freedom that we can use when we talk about things in a coarse-grained way. And for instance, the magnetization uh, is the sum of these four spins. That's why the first row of this matrix is 1, 1, 1, 1. And the X component of the field is uh, the sum of the first two spins uh, and then subtract off the uh, spins three and four. And that explains this uh, second line of the matrix. So there's another step to uh, see what we learn from that. But can I, can I check whether that came across as at least halfway plausible? So, um, sorry, the, uh, no, no, I, the half is just because I wanted to write down an orthogonal matrix, and so, yeah. Um, okay, so now the point is that uh, we have a theory which is expressed in terms of these degrees of freedom. Um, but when we go out and do an experiment, then we're probing these degrees of freedom, and we're doing all of this in uh, reciprocal space in terms of, of wave vectors rather than in, in real space. And um, when we take account of this transformation, then these uh, minus signs look like phase factors which you get from e to the i the scattering wave vector times the uh, position vector of the different sites. And so if we uh, look at small q structure in the uh, flux, uh, well, small q, you might think that would be near the origin of reciprocal space. But because of these minus signs, it gets transferred to uh, the vicinity of uh, Bragg points in the scattering uh, with uh, non-zero uh, wave vector. Okay, so is, is that all right? So, so now we're ready to, to look at some uh, experimental data. So what you can do is take uh, one of these materials and do uh, elastic uh, neutron scattering from it. And um, so that basically gives you uh, a Fourier transform of the uh, spin configuration. And um, what you see is the experimental version of the theoretical pattern that I had uh, earlier on in one of my slides in uh, red and blue. And uh, the point is that you have uh, sharp features in reciprocal space which tell you uh, about these uh, long-range correlations uh, in real space. And in fact, these are uh, precisely uh, the Fourier transforms of the um, uh, power law correlations. I mean, in fact, I said that you had correlators which were of the form QI, QJ over Q squared. And uh, that is a function of angle as you go around uh, Q equals zero, Q equals zero, which now is transferred to a uh, somewhat finite wave vector through the uh, transformations that I described. And uh, the fact that the intensity goes from high to low to high to low as you go around here is just the behavior of this function as you go around uh, the, the origin in uh, Q space. OK, so the message is, yeah. Good. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, the uh, horizontal and vertical axes are two directions in reciprocal space. Uh, and um, uh, you're also taking a, a particular slice in the third direction. And the intensity is the uh, scattering cross-section. 
Yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, but, but the basic message is that uh, you have these materials, spin ices, uh, which are uh, a very good realization of, of this uh, Coulomb phase physics. And um, on the one hand, from the heat capacity and entropy measurements I was talking about, we see the ground state degeneracies. And uh, on the other hand, from measuring correlations, we see these uh, long range correlations that uh, follow from the uh, local constraints. OK, so um, now we should go on to this issue of um, excitations, uh, which, again, will follow rather closely in parallel with what I was talking about for the triangular lattice uh, antiferromagnet. So um, what I want to think about doing is starting from a ground state, so you can check for yourselves. I think that this is a ground state. You can see that each of these uh, tetrahedra that I've drawn has two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out. And then you can say we're going to make an excitation, and we'll do that by picking on one of these spins, for example, the one that I'm indicating here, and reversing its orientation. So when we do that, we have uh, three spins pointing in to this tetrahedron and three spins pointing out of that tetrahedron. And in that sense, this lower blue tetrahedron becomes uh, a source of the emergent flux that I've been talking about. And the uh, one above uh, becomes a, a sink of the emergent flux. So you can probably imagine what's going to happen next. We've uh, made uh, a single spin flip and uh, generated two tetrahedra that are not in their ground state. And uh, they can be fractionalized. They can be separated without paying any extra energy price. Because if I uh, flip, for example, this spin over here, then uh, I return uh, the blue tetrahedron to its ground state, but I uh, excite the uh, green tetrahedron uh, and uh, make it a, a source of this flux. And of course, I can uh, carry on uh, flipping spins to separate these uh, two uh, excitations uh, further and further. So um, these excitations are like the uh, monomers that I was talking about in um, uh, diamond models uh, in that they're uh, sources and sinks of the flux. And so in terms of this uh, emergent gauge field, uh, they're like monopole uh, charges. And um, so one question we can ask is, uh, what about the uh, entropic interaction between uh, a pair of oppositely charged monopoles. And uh, now we can use the ideas that I was talking about this morning. Uh, so uh, this is like uh, three-dimensional electro electromagnetism. Um, and the uh, entropic potential is the same as what you'd have from Coulomb's law. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a 1 over r potential. And that means that if we uh, create uh, a monopole antimonopole pair in neighboring tetrahedra, then we start with uh, an interaction uh, which incidentally would be a attractive uh, if they're oppositely charged, uh, and with uh, R being the uh, distance between two neighboring tetrahedra, and the uh, effective potential that you'd uh, pay to separate them to infinity is, is finite. And so uh, these uh, excitations are, are deconfined. So if we think about the interactions between uh, these monopoles, then uh, according to the um, long distance description of the ground states that I've been talking about, uh, we, we have this 1 over r potential. Uh, 
and that's purely entropic in origin. Uh, so uh, if we're going to put something into an ordinary Boltzmann factor, it's beta times the potential uh, that goes like 1 over r. In other words, uh, there isn't really any temperature in here. It's, it's just entropy. Um, and if we had a material with just nearest neighbor interactions, that would be the end of the story. Um, but, of course, in any magnet, there are dipolar interactions. And if the exchange interactions are, are large, then those dipolar interactions are not very important. But uh, in this material, as you saw from the uh, heat capacity measurements, the whole energy scales are rather low, a few Kelvin. And also, since the magnetic moments are rather large, the dipole interactions are rather large. So actually, uh, dipolar uh, interactions are, are quite important in these materials. So once you realize that, you feel that that's rather unfortunate and it probably spoils this picture because uh, these different ground states that I've been talking about, the macroscopically degenerate ground states, are macroscopically degenerate really because of an accident of the nearest neighbor model. And once we include further neighbor interactions, these dipolar interactions, then that degeneracy is going to be lifted and uh, at least in principle, this whole story collapses. Um, and that's true, but fortunately only to an extent. So uh, you can find out the effect of these dipolar interactions uh, on spin ice. So this is uh, a phase diagram as a function of temperature and the strength of the dipolar interactions compared with the nearest neighbor exchange. And the details don't matter very much, but uh, the overall point is that at a rather low temperature, this material would order in principle. Um, but in reality, what happens is the things, uh, the dynamics slows down as you go to low temperatures, and uh, it would take uh, much longer than experimental timescales uh, for the system to arrive at the ordered state. So what you probe experimentally is this highly correlated state that you would understand even uh, in the um, nearest neighbor model. So in other words, the uh, lifting of the uh, nearest neighbor model ground state degeneracy from uh, dipolar interactions turns out to be uh, less important uh, than, than you might have thought. So it's a, a bug, but one that doesn't ruin the whole story. Uh, but then the beautiful thing is, it turns out to be a bug that's also uh, a, a very nice feature. And the nice feature comes when you think about the interactions between uh, these uh, fractionalized uh, excitations, which are monopoles of the uh, emergent uh, gauge field. And the point is that they turn out also to be magnetic monopoles. And to understand how that goes, um, the nicest way of viewing things is to say that uh, although these spins are um, really microscopic dipole moments, we can think of them in a fictitious way as being made up out of uh, magnetic charges, plus and minus, with some finite separation uh, with the size of the charge and the separation chosen to uh, restore the uh, correct microscopic uh, dipole moment. So in other words, what we're doing is replacing something which really should be an exact dipole uh, with uh, a pair of charges with finite separation. And what that does is introduce higher uh, multipole contributions, but uh, reproduces the uh, dipole contribution exactly. So. Where does that get us? Well, if we think of all the spins in the lattice like this and ask what happens in uh, a ground state of spin ice, then uh, since uh, in a ground state there are two spins pointing in and two out of every tetrahedron, that means in this representation, if we choose the distance between the two charges to match the distance between the centers of the two uh, tetrahedra, uh, 
there'll be two positive charges and two negative charges uh, at the center of each tetrahedron. In other words, these charges will cancel. And uh, that means, in fact, that with this uh, approximation to the dipolar interactions, we'll restore the uh, degeneracy of the uh, ground states that we also had in the nearest neighbor model. But now, if we think about making excitations, the effect of making an excitation is to spoil the cancellation that we had at the center of each tetrahedra between the uh, magnetic charges. And so we'll have uh, a net charge of one sign uh, at the centers of uh, some of the uh, tetrahedra and a net charge of the other sign uh, at the centers of the other tetrahedra. So what this means is that um, in addition to the uh, entropic interaction that comes from the emergent gauge field, because of the dipolar interactions, uh, we've also got a real uh, magnetic interaction between these monopoles. So it, it's a pretty remarkable situation. So there are situations which uh, are probably familiar to you where you have long-range interactions, Coulomb interactions, which then get screened. So uh, you may know that in a plasma, you say at finite temperature, you can have uh, device screening and so on. Uh, so it's easy to convert long-range interactions into short-range ones. What we're doing here is exactly the opposite. We're taking not a completely short-range interaction, but a dipolar interaction, which falls off like one over r cubed, and we're converting it into an interaction between monopoles, which falls off like 1 over r. And uh, so we're promoting uh, a more rapidly decaying interaction into uh, a more slowly decaying interaction. It's a kind of anti-screening. And it comes because of all the correlations in these uh, Coulomb phase ground states. Um, so. Uh, when that came up as a, a theoretical idea, of course, the question is, question became, uh, is there any uh, experimental evidence uh, that really uh, shows that there are these uh, Coulomb interactions uh, at work in the material? And uh, the first suggestion, and I think probably still the, the best one, is, is this. Um, and uh, it's a comparison with an experiment that had been done before the theoretical ideas were developed, uh, which um, in fact used a, a magnetic field to control the density of these monopoles. So just to give you an idea how that works, if I draw a tetrahedron like that and uh, take a ground state with two in, two out like that, and I apply a magnetic field in this direction, then if the field is strong enough, it'll make it favorable to flip this spin so that it points in. In other words, it'll control the density of monopoles. So by varying magnetic field and temperature, you're able to go between uh, a low density and a high density phase of monopoles. And that's a bit like the liquid gas transition. And when you work out the theory, if you go through a transition like that in this situation, uh, just in a model with short range interactions, then it turns out to be uh, continuous. Uh, but if you include the long range interactions, these uh, magnetic monopole interactions, then it's converted into a first order transition. And experimentally, it had already been found uh, to be uh, a first order transition. So this, uh, albeit slightly indirectly, uh, really does show you that you have these uh, long range uh, interactions between monopoles. So of course, this is uh, very famous work by uh, two of the organizers of this school. OK, uh, so I think that finishes what I want to show today. I've tried to explain how uh, spin ice gives you, first of all, a, a realization of this uh, Coulomb phase physics in, in three dimensions. And um, we have very clear experimental signatures of these power law correlations via the uh, neutron scattering experiments. 
and uh, we have classically fractionalized excitations uh, in this uh, three-dimensional system. So, uh, questions? Uh, sorry, is only yeah. Okay, so the question was uh, when you calculate these correlations uh, from the um, emerging gauge field description, uh, are you only allowing for spin configurations with div b equals zero? Uh, and and the answer is yes. And so then the question would be. Uh, what's the justification? Well, uh, if you go to low temperatures, then the density of these monopoles should get very low. I mean, in fact, there's a Boltzmann factor because it costs a, a finite multiple of the exchange energy to generate these monopoles. Uh, there'll be, be a Boltzmann factor which will uh, suppress the density uh, as you go to the low temperatures. Yes, but, but the experiment's still at a sufficiently low temperature that the density of monopoles is, is very low. So, I mean, the basic point is that uh, a non-zero density for the monopoles sets uh, correlation length, and this Coulomb phase physics is still good out to the correlation length, and the correlation length corresponds to the density of monopoles, and that density can be made very low if you go to low temperatures. I mean, then there are questions about equilibration and so on. Yeah, so if you have a pair of interactions which are close to each other, sorry, a pair of excitations which pair of monopoles which are close to each other in one part of the sample and then another pair over here, then uh, you'll have an interaction between the two pairs, uh, which you can understand by adding together the uh, entropic contributions and the um, magnetic monopole contributions. Um, well, we, we should distinguish here between the uh, entropic contributions which are described by, by the emergent B field that I talked about and also the, uh, and on the other hand, the magnetic contributions which come from the fact that the spins have dipolar interactions. But, uh, I mean, in both cases, you, you expect to understand what the interactions are by thinking about the corresponding version of electromagnetism. I mean, the fictitious electromagnetism for the emergent gauge field and real electromagnetism for the, the monopoles. So, so you'll get a, an interaction between a, a pair of dipoles, but it's what you would expect from adding up the contributions from the different charges. Yes. Uh, y yes, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, you also have to think about uh, as they move you have to think about the effect that their motion has on the spin background. So, I mean, the point is that the magnetic field couples to the dipoles, so, uh, to, to the spins via a dipole, so in the presence of a magnetic field, 
uh, you affect the energy of the, the spins, and so you can promote the reorientation of the spins. And that's the same thing as uh, exerting a force directly on the dipole. Sorry, on the monopole. Yes. Yes. Um, well, when you go to the limit, it's actually not very interesting because uh, if every tetrahedron has a monopole in it, that simply corresponds to a state where the spins are doing what the magnetic field tells them. So in this picture, I have that orientation for the spin. And if I just repeat that, then I have some unique state for the system, uh, which I can describe as uh, a lattice full of monopoles, but uh, it's a unique state, so there's none of the interesting statistical physics uh, to talk about. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you, you wouldn't really want to be talking about spin waves in, in this system because it's very strongly Ising uh, and... Uh, um, well, often when you talk about spin waves, you're talking about the dynamics and uh, the dynamics here is a, a separate story, but it, it's rather slow uh, relaxation in any case. Uh, but if you're talking about the statistical mechanics, then um, as you reduce the field from the one that saturates the system, then uh, you can reverse chains of spins and you can think of those as being like flux lines inserted into the lattice. And there is, there is some interesting statistical physics uh, associated with, with that transition from the saturation magnetization. <laughs>